um, how we test the connections in the various fuses. We're going to be using both an AC power supply. We have a, a standard GFCI protected outlet here that we're going to be showing how to test. And off to the screen, you can just barely see it, we have a backup DC battery. We're only showing AeroChem today. I will be referring a bit to the NCON style collector. If your site has any questions about that, feel free to ask their questions. Uh, primarily, we're going to be orienting this to the AeroChem for simplicity, but the terms and checks we do are going to be applicable to both types of collectors. And I, again, thanks, Jeffrey, for letting me be on screen, because I get to give Jeffrey tasks today here um, as we're going to be troubleshooting our setup, and we're going to be using a couple tools. Uh, the first thing we're going to be doing is troubleshooting the AC line voltage that comes into your site. Um, we basically stop at the outlet. If you have conditions at the line power at your site, the incoming 120 volt nominal voltage, we'll have to refer you to an electrician. But we are going to tell you how to troubleshoot your incoming power if you have an issue uh, and some testing you can do and some ideas that you could relay to your electrician if you're having problems. Then we're going to be talking about our multimeters and then finally about DC power supplies. Uh, but to get started, um, I've done something to this setup that it may or may not be operational. And I'm going to invite Jeffrey to come up and do his weekly check and see how things operate. And as I've mentioned, go ahead and ask questions as we go along. As uh, you approach the site as usual and, uh, and sample uh, validity and trying to maintain sample validity, when you first get to the site, notice what's going on at the site as you approach it. Uh, anything out of the ordinary that you may remark on in section 10 of your field form. But what we want to do is uh, the first thing I like to do as an operator uh, is you know check things around the site, make sure that you know has anybody mowed, has anybody uh, is there any construction, uh, farm agricultural activity, uh, livestock activity, anything like that. As we approach the uh, collector, what we want to do is lay the palm of our hand, uh, primarily the fatty part, and I'll and I'll be you'll see a hand coming in and out. That's uh, that's the most they want to show of me today, I guess, is just the uh, extremities, uh, a face made for radio. But what we want to do is lay the palm of our hand on this sensor to see if we have a little bit of heat. That's uh, one of the primary checks. Even when the collector is closed, you should feel a little bit of heat out of your sensor. Not to be confused with it, if you're like in Arizona or one of the far southern uh, states where you're getting you know, the 100 degree temperatures and that sensor is going to be hot, it may be tough to distinguish between what we want to construe as the function of the sensor and the heat of the sun. So we're going to lay the palm of our hand on there. And I'm not feeling much heat. So uh, that already makes me kind of aware that there could possibly be something. So without further ado, what I'm going to do is I'm going to prepare myself with my bucket my lid as if everything is working properly and that I'm going to be opening the collector and exposing the website. So you always want to prepare yourself as if you're going to change the sample. So I've got everything prepared by my bucket, my notes, and everything along those lines. I'm going to wet the sensor. I wet the sensor and absolutely nothing happens. Uh, that worries me that we could have initially a power problem. Uh, this particular site that we set up in a mock fashion is a AC with a DC backup. Initially, what I want to do is to check my AC source. Uh, being a GFCI type of uh, setup, uh, being very careful, I do not want to start at the collector and work backwards trying to determine what my problem will be. I always want to start at the source, and that being the plug where the collector is actually plugged in. Okay, And we do provide um, receptacle testers. We'll provide these to you to sites. If you need one, um, you can email us at ntn at isws.illinois.edu or put a note on the field form. That's just the standard email. Or, or give a call to the 1-800 number. And that's 1-800-952-7353. We'd be happy to send one to you. This is really the best way to test your uh, power that's coming in from your outlet. And it's a nice setup. You simply plug it in, and then there's colored lights that tell you the voltage conditions. So I'm going to hand this to Jeffrey for him to try out. 
as Chris is uh, talking about this, one of the first things that we forgot to mention is the fact is that we always want to preach safety. Uh, safety first. Uh, you know, you may be acclimated to knowing how to use your voltmeter, uh, your multimeter, but we don't want you ever sticking the probes of the multimeter into, you know, sticking them into a light socket, so to speak. Uh, safety, you know, a lot of times you get out to your site, you may have wet, dewy ground underneath you. Uh, we don't want to uh, impose the accident, any sort of accidents. And as we uh, said in practicing the other day, we've, uh, we're a network of 30 plus years and we've never really had, knock on wood, any sort of accidents, uh, you know, that have really put people down. So uh, we preach safety. As Chris said, what I'm going to do, and I apologize as I duck in and out of the, the screen, is I'm going to plug it into my outlet source to see if I have any power. As I plug it in, the indicator shows nothing on the receptacle tester, so that makes me wonder if I might have a problem with my outlet. Now, this being a GFCI type of outlet, it's real easy for me to potentially reset it for uh, electrical purposes. Not every site is going to have this particular type of outlet. So what I'm going to do to figure this out is I'm going to now unplug this and not try to work around the other plug itself. I have the capability of plugging in, or pushing in the GFCI, and as I plugged it in, the collector took off. So that told me that the problem that I was having was resetting my AC power. Yes, where I tripped the GFCI outlet, there's a test and a reset button, and the outlet had been tripped. This outlet's convenient. You might be able to just barely see on the screen. Some newer ones have a small light to show they're operating. We knew the collector was operating. We saw the clutch and heard it spinning around, what I'm pointing to with a red pointer. Uh, this is what would have driven the lid. So yes, as Jeffrey noted, um, we had tripped the GFCI outlet. This is a common problem we see at sites. We do realize code requires GFCI outlets in most every location, but they can be problematic. Uh, and I just want to talk about that briefly, if that's a problem at your site. Uh, many of you, for our purposes here, we just have an open outlet, but many of you would just have uh, an outlet with a standard cover, something like this, where you just lift it up to use it. And really, that's not designed for continual use. Um, it's designed for intermittent use, so you temporarily plugged in some tools or something. What we recommend for your GFCI outlet, especially if you're getting trip circuits is um, what's called an in-use cover. And I picked this up at our local Walmart yesterday. And what it has is a gasket that seals around the outlet. And then there's a cover that completely covers the outlet. And that lets you pass the cords through it. And it protects the outlet from moisture. The purpose of the GFCI outlet is to make sure we do not have any faults or we have leakage of electricity from the outlet through anything but a circuit. And moisture and rainfall can get into the outlet and cause it to trip. So that's why uh, to meet uh, requirements for continual outdoor use, we do require these. Um, if you do have continual GFCI outlet trips, we're going to have to refer you to an electrician. I was on the internet to look for some tips um, to see if there's anything you can do. And it sounds like, bottom line, there's various grades of GFCI outlets. Some work better than others. Typically, the more expensive ones work better. Um, so you may need to consult with an electrician if you're continually having a problematic tripping of your GFCI outlet. One thing also to remember is if you incur any problems like this, make sure that you always mark it in the remarks section of the field form, knowing that what you do or do not tell us is something that uh, you know may be a mystery to us when we get the field form and look at the data, discover that you may have had two or three inches of rain, but maybe only a couple collector openings. So whatever you find, make sure to uh, give us that information. One thing I wanted to add that I did not do, uh, as soon as I reset that uh, GFCI, the collector opened. But I do not want to necessarily take and assume that everything is working properly. So I am going to take this receptacle tester for a second time and plug it into the outlet that was supposedly having problems. So as I plug it in, I'm getting the bright yellow lights. Those indicate that everything is okay with that particular outlet 
So that makes me feel safe that I'm going to be able to conduct uh, changing my sample and stuff like that, and the problem was there. We'll uh, talk about other problems besides what is just in the receptacle itself as we progress. Leave that there just a second, Jeffrey. Um, I do want to note a few more things. The reason these are very nice, for one, they're inexpensive and easy to use, um, but they really do check the entire condition of the circuit and most common wiring problems, reversed wiring and open ground. I just want to touch briefly on grounding of your site. Uh, if this does show the two yellow lights, that is the correct condition. That does indicate that the equipment is grounded to the minimum requirements of code for outsole use. Um, and that would go for both your collector and rain gauge. You really do need the three wire connection to make that ground. Uh, to have that uh, be suitable for outdoor use. We have questions over the years about lightning protection. And um, at our own site that we operate in Bonneville, Illinois, we do get a lot of lightning strikes. We do have our electronic rain gauge grounded with a separate grounding rod. And we have all of our grounds tied together. So if you have con particular conditions, it's kind of a case-by-case -case basis, uh, please feel free to contact and we can give you advice um, about how you may want to ground your equipment. Uh, we have a few questions. We do have one question. Uh, the question is, where are the procedure documents? Uh, is typed in in case you didn't see it. Uh, documents are found at the website go.illinois.edu forward slash NADP training. And uh, you can just click on that, and that will give you uh, yeah, you, the. You follow the sublink to today's webinar. It should be the top link you see there for uh, today. That's how you access this. Uh, below the access to the any meeting session is the downloads. You'll go to a web folder, and then you'll see the two documents posted there. I believe they're uh, Adobe Acrobat documents. Any other questions? No, and a reminder throughout this uh, webinar today, as Chris said earlier in his introduction, if there is any questions, don't ever hesitate to uh, email the website at the top of every field form, NTN at ifws.illinois.edu or call the 1-800, that's 1-800-952-7353. So this would be the end of AC, that would be your incoming 120 volt testing. The extent of the testing we'd have you do would be a receptacle tester. And again, we'll ha be happy to send you one if you don't have one. Uh, if you do have any fault conditions, we will have to refer you to an electrician at your site. Uh, our program. Uh, assumes that you have correctly operating power, and we're, we're not really qualified because of different codes to, to give you tips beyond little things about adding covers to that. Um, if there's no questions about troubleshooting the AC line power, let's proceed and talk about testing our low voltage power using our multimeters. And for that, I'll just give you a minute. We're going to turn to the uh, first handout using a multimeter. I'm not going to be reading the entire thing. I'm just going to be referring to you to certain bullet points and pages in there. Um, you can read it for yourself, but I want to highlight some of the points. And so I'll be referring to the pages that are marked in the multimeter session. Anything else you want to add, Jeffrey, before we continue? Nope. No. And the reason we're going to learn the multimeter now is because we're going to be using it through the rest of the webinar to do the troubleshooting um, of our collector motor box. So we're going to go ahead and turn to page two of the handout, and it's just what a multimeter is. Uh, a multimeter is used to test multiple electrical parameters, voltage, resistance, and current. Uh, we're only going to be using our multimeter today to test the voltage coming out of our collector motor box and battery and to test fuse conditions. And I'll try not to knock my microphone. Sorry about that. Uh, and there are two types of multimeters that we've provided over the past. There's the digital multimeter, like I'm holding up, or some of you may have uh, an analog multimeter. Both are fine. I'm, both of the things I'm talking about are applicable to uh, either type. Generally, these last few years, we've been supplying the digital multimeters. They seem to operate a little better. And we do provide those. Again, email us at ntn at isws.illinois.edu or call 1-800-952-7353. Uh, we stock these. We get them from our local Harbor Freight store. And we'd be happy to send you one. So to set up your multimeter, you have leads. There's a red lead and a black lead. Um, they are specific to the meter. The ones that were used for our analog meter do not work on our digital one. 
And so the first thing you need to do is plug the probes into the correct position. So this multimeter is marked with COM, which means common or ground. Sometimes they even say black. And you simply take the uh, banana plug end of the wire and plug it into the common port. And then this one has two additional ports. It actually very closely matches the diagram you see on page three. Um, we want the middle port because we're going to be using this for measuring voltages and resistance. And nicely on this meter, we won't have to switch it once we set it up. So the banana plugs go into the meter, and then you've got these probes that are used to actually test the equipment. This one has a power switch in the middle. Some of them, like the analog meter I have, have a dial position. So we turn it on to get the reading. And what I'd suggest, um, I know following hands-on activities on webinars is, is marginally satisfying. Uh, we'd be happy to send you a meter and you could test it in your office or, or do some testing that we do here with some common batteries for yourself. How the meter is laid out is we have a digital display where we have the readings. I know you can't see it on the camera, so Jeffrey will be reading out readings today. We have a dial that we use to pick the various functions. Uh, we have various symbols on here and codes that tell us what the function is. And then we've already spoke about the probe connections. And if you're following along, I'm on page four of the handout. Looking at page five of the handout, various meters use symbols. Uh, your meter probably comes with an instruction book. We will be using the uh, straight line indicator for DC voltage. Ours happens to be marked DCV, standing for DC voltage. And we'll be using um, what's called a diode check. That's the little one. Uh, the sixth symbol down, it's showing a one directional current, like an arrow running into a wall, uh, to check the condition of our fuses. Those are the two we're going to be using today. And again, your meter probably comes with an instruction manual. So the first exercise we're going to do is show how we measure voltage. I'm on page six of your handout. Uh, the second bullet point, we've already discussed AC voltage. That would be your house current. That AC stands for alternating current. Uh, and our batteries provide DC current. And that for, stands for direct current. AC voltage is typically the high voltage, 120 volts. And DC current is typically the low voltage of 12 volts. Um, there's the third bullet down. We're going to be talking about how to set our meters. And you want to be careful with these tips that you don't short things out when you're doing that. I generally hold them like this, kind of keep them separate uh, so you know where they both are. You don't have one trailing across the table shorting something out. I like to keep them both in my hand when I'm using the meter. So the first thing I'm going to do, um, I'm going to test the voltage of a standard household 9-volt battery. And I'm going to show how we do that. So the first step I need to do is to look at the front of my meter and I look at the session marked DC voltage. That happens to be in the upper, uh, from your perspective, it's my upper right, so that's upper, your upper left. And I know it's a nominal 9-volt battery. Uh, my voltmeter is marked with uh, 20 millivolts, 2,000 millivolts, and 20 volts. So I'm going to put it on the 20-volt setting, and that's adequate for testing our collector and our battery. So I'm going to set the meter down here where we can still be on the camera. And I'm going to put the probes here. Uh, we have a red for positive and a black for negative, so that where Jeffrey can read it out for us. And we'll talk a bit about polarity. For low voltage polarity, and what I mean by that is how we connect up the probes, isn't critical, but it is always good practice to do your best to mine the polarity. So for example, my battery is marked plus. On one side, I'm going to connect the red probe to the positive side and the black probe to the other one. And note how I try to keep from shorting this out. And I'm going to put that there. And Jeffrey, what are we reading? We have 9.46 DC volts. OK. It's hard to see. Ah, where I'm sitting. I see. If I put it there. All right. Thank you, folks. I'm going to show what happens if we reverse the polarity. So I'm just going to flip my battery around and connect the black 
in the red to the wrong ones? What are you reading, Jeff? And you're going to get a negative reading. Uh, basically, it tells you that the probes are backwards, uh, no danger to it, but you get a minus reading of 9.46. The reason I emphasize that point is digital meters don't have a problem. They simply show a minus sign if you have reverse polarity. If you have an analog meter, what you will see is it just simply bottoms out. It can't show a negative. It can only show the positive. So if you see, if you're using an analog meter and it's bottoming out, it probably means, most likely means you have a reverse polarity. Right, do we have any questions at this point? The question is, uh, explain the red connector needs to go into a different socket for different measurements. It was noted that there were two sockets for red, but not, uh, what each one was used for. Okay, my apologies. Um, the black one, uh, the common for virtually every meter I've seen, the black lead will always be on the same one. Uh, the red lead is currently on one marked voltage and resistance. Um, and for our purposes, that's why we like this meter. Basically, once you have it connected in, I did make that point. Um, for the purposes of testing our equipment, you do not have to move the probe. The top mark is for measuring amperage. That would be current. Uh, in general troubleshooting, there wouldn't be a need for that. So that's why we generally supply these meters, because you, you should always note the position, but you would not have to move it for the purposes of the electrical testing we do. So thank you for that question. And you heard as I was talking, our collector was running, the sensor dried off, and it went ahead and closed for us. So we know that's running. Um, I'm going to move on and talk about testing of fuses now. I'm on page eight of your handout, and that goes into resistance and conductivity. Um, I'm not going to go through all of that. Um, basically, I'm just going to highlight that we're using resistance and conductivity to test the operation of our circuit. Um, some meters are nice. They have an alarm built in that you can tell whether fuses are running. This one doesn't. We're going to have to use the reading there. So I'm going to show how to test a fuse. I have some fuses here, cartridge fuses that we use in our collector. It's marked good fuses, so we hope we have a good one in here. One of the things that are imperative is please don't uh, trust the function of the fuse by eyesight al alone. They can look good and still be bad. That's why we always ask that when you're uh, going to the site that one of the tools that you take with us or take with you is a, uh, your multimeter or your voltmeter. Okay, so this is the cartridge type fuse that we do use in our collector. I'll be pointing those out in a minute. They are glass um, and they have two metal ends. In very fine print on one end it shows the voltage rating and on the other end it shows the amperage rating. And the amperage rating is applicable no matter what voltage you have. So uh, this fuse happens to have a rating of 250 volts uh, and for um, one amp, but uh, it's used even for low voltage. So how the fuse works is there's a fuse wire in the middle. I'm using my red pointer to show that. And as Jeffrey noted, this one's easy to see, but you can have the fuse burn out. And that's literally what happens. If you blow the fuse, this wire melts, but it can melt under the end, so it will look perfectly fine, but not actually work. So what we need to do is test the condition. To test the condition, I'm going to be putting this in diode check mode, and that is in the lower uh, quadrant. It looks like a little arrow going into a um, solid line. What that's indicating is it's indicating a direction of a power for checking a diode, uh, but it's good for us. And I'm going to show how this works. So, Jeffrey, what's the meter reading right now? It is currently reading one, which means that there is no contact. And I'm going to put these two probes together. And what's it reading now? We currently have 0 0.2. 0 0.2. It should be close to zero. If I rub it, maybe get a little better connection. Uh, yep, we're down to about 0.1 now. Yep. So what this does is reads one when you have an open circuit, and when you have a completed circuit, it reads zero. So if we have a good fuse, um, it should read zero. So I'm going to put one end of the probe on the one end of the fuse and one probe on the other. And what are we reading, Jeffrey? We're currently reading 0 0.1. 0 0.1. So that indicates that this fuse is of good condition. Note that the polarity doesn't really matter for a fuse. Um, it doesn't matter whether you have it oriented one way or the other. 
Now I happen to have some uh, fuses that we knew were blown. I will come back to those later when we trick Jeffrey a little bit later in the presentation. Um, so I'm going to show one of those. So I'm going to test this fuse, and what are we reading, Jeffrey? You're still going to get the same reading as the open circuit uh, with the fuse being blown at read one. Okay. So that is how we check our fuses. And once you have a blown fuse, um, unless you're using it for training, it's of no use. So simply discard it so you don't get confused. You can get fuses at a hardware store. Um, we'll talk about the rating in a minute when we talk about the collector. Uh, but they're generally available at most auto parts store. We'll also supply them. Again, just call us or email us, and we will send you fuses if you need them. That's all for multimeter use. I've shown you the extent of what we need for the rest of today's webinar. Um, are there any questions at this point? You have a moment for somebody to ask a question. On the uh, old analog style, uh, the symbol for continuity is the omega symbol. That's on the black one that we have. I believe it. Is it the Omega? Yeah, it's the Ohm symbol, yes. So, Actually, this one says OHM, so it's very okay. helpful. OK. And there again, if you have any questions, you know, uh, if we didn't cover it today and it's not covered in your appendages, uh, don't hesitate to give us a call or an email and ask. OK, we're going to switch gears here, and I'm going to talk about the connections to our Aerochem metrics type uh, control box, the, the motor box. Um, what I'm showing you is somewhat applicable to NCON collectors. This is slightly more complex. We have more fuses and more connections. Uh, I will be referring to NCON collectors later in this presentation, but I just want to go through the connections in the ACM type box first. Uh, we are still connected to the AC power, so the connection you see in your lower left-hand corner here is the AC inlet port. It has a fuse right above it. The next connection is your event recorder. This sends out a voltage to the electronic rain gauge or your Belfort rain gauge when the collector is open to indicate that we are collecting precipitation. It has its fuse connection right above it. And then the last connection uh, here is slightly different. This is the sensor wire that comes into the motor box. Above it is the connection for the DC battery backup and its fuse. So each of these three electrical connections has a fuse. Each can have issues. And we'll be talking about how we troubleshoot those issues. You'll note on this collector, um, do they say, what are the vol each collector has its fuse rating right on it? Is yeah, it the, both the, uh, the uh, AC and the event recorder are over the one amp. And the, uh, the DC is of two amps. So make sure to get the proper fuse, and we'll talk about that in a minute if, if something in troubleshooting, if something were to occur. And then uh, just a note I made earlier, the one amp fuse is interchangeable between the AC, the high voltage AC, and the low voltage event recorder. Um, the, the amperage rating is the same. Those fuses are interchangeable. But we have a two amp fuse for the DC power. So this is high voltage, uh, and the rest of the voltage is nominally about 12 to 14 volts. Um, so let's uh, switch gears and talk about the backup battery first, Jeffrey. The purpose of this port on your motor box is it serves uh, as a trickle charger to a backup battery. And right here, we, we do have a backup battery here in our studio. We're going to show how we connect that up. So while the collector receives incoming AC power, it constantly puts out 12 volts. And then we can connect that up to the battery. Before we cook that up, let's go ahead and verify the voltages that are coming out of that. So what I'm, going, multimeter. what I'm going to do with my multimeter now is get the correct. As I put my hand in front of you once again, put the get on the correct voltage that I want. Where uh, when you've got a multimeter like this, you do not want to put your setting on something that you know could possibly exceed that. So if I'm if I'm going to measure 12 to 14 volts. I wouldn't want to put it on 10 volts because then it, you would uh, definitely be over the uh, voltage limit. So what I'm going to do, and polarity in this case does matter, and it's indicated on the front of the motor box as I've got my DC voltage setting on my multimeter, I'm going to lay the red probe on the positive and the black probe on the negative. And as I lay them on there, I'll try to put them in here, and I'll lay down the probe 
or the multimeter to make myself a little bit more functional. I have a reading, and you got to trust me on this one, 13.7. So we know that we have the current necessary uh, out of the motor box to run this collector off of a battery backup. And if we didn't have any voltage here where he was connecting, and I'm just going to point where you can see it there, um, we might suspect that it's the fuse right above it. Or uh, in rare instances, we'll have over voltage or voltage that isn't quite there. That can indicate something wrong with the electronics in the motor box. Uh, do we want to talk about event recorders next, the event recorder voltage while we're checking? Yeah, we can do that. Uh, part of the troubleshooting scenario is what we monitor on the Belfort charts, uh, the way it should be indicated with every opening of the collector, there should be rain precipitation to correspond with the opening of the collector. So if you've got, as we read your Belfort chart, or even it, your electronic gauge these, these days, uh, if we see that you have an inch and a half precipitation, but your event recorder doesn't indicate that the collector opened at all, then we know that we possibly have a uh, event recorder issue. So what we want to do, I'm trying not to sneeze here, is to uh, check the output. The way this should read is when the collector is closed, then your, your reading should be zero. So once again, on the event recorder, you want to get in solid practice is polarity doesn't matter. So I'm going to set the collector or the uh, voltage output because the maximum the event recorder is going to do is between 12 and 14 volt DC. So I'm going to set my probes on there. And when the collectors close, I should get a reading of zero. And once again, you're going to have to believe me that I got the reading of zero. Now, okay, well, I'm going to, I'll move my hands, okay, my apologies. As my uh, moderator, Brian Kirshner, a lot of credit goes to him in case I didn't mention his name. So now you can see I do have a reading of zero. Okay, let's, let's set the scenario. I go and I know my collector's closed and I set my probes and uh, I call you and tell you that I, you know, you don't have any event recorder openings. And you say, well, I think it's working okay. And I tell you to take your voltmeter and go out and check to see if you have any current out of your motor box. And you set your probes on your event recorder terminal. And with the collector closed, you have a reading of about 12 and a half to 14. That indicates that there is a problem within the motor box sending a signal. This is all set up on a, a like a motherboard. Uh, the whole scenario of this is uh, power in. Uh, trip by the sensor. When the sensor trips, the event record, the collector moves from uh, the wet side to the dry side. It sends a signal to the event recorder. The sensor heats up. The rain gauge uh, makes a tick mark or indicates on the uh, electronic gauges that something has occurred. And when it dries off and it closes, all everything should go to zero. And that's pretty much the way it works as far as sending the signals in the event recorder and the, the sensor. So in that indication that we have voltage, then we have a problem, and uh, we'll talk about that as we progress. Uh, should we go ahead and trip the collector? Do I get to spray sure, with water? Sure, go ahead. You wanna, you I want to spray you, with water. You tried squirting me yesterday, so you might as yeah. well do it again. You never saw Pat squirt Vanna in all the years of Wheel of Fortune, so I wouldn't want you to do it on the first time. Yeah. As, a, as the collector opens, make sure when you're doing your testing that you put enough water on the sensor to keep it open so you can do your testing without it going back and forth. One of the tests I may ask you to make is what I call the one drop test. With the sensor the way it's supposed to work is in the ambient heater between when it's closed to when it's open, if you lay one drop of water on the sensor grid, it should take anywhere from about 7 to 11 minutes for that sensor to heat up and burn off that one drop. That gives you a good indication. If you've got, say, put one drop on there, it takes 20, 25 minutes for it to close, then we know we potentially have a sensor issue. Uh, if we, it closes right away or it never closes, then we could also indicate that we have an issue within the motor box as far as switching goes, and we talk about that as we troubleshoot it. But that's just one thing uh, not to get into different scenarios uh, in something we're trying to simplify. But uh, these are checks that I will ask you to make if you call me up and the collector is not functioning properly. So now that we've opened the collector, I'm going to move my hands out of the way once again, lay my probes on the event recorder, and it says that I have 12.37 volts DC coming out of my event recorder terminal. Okay, if I were to, when the collector was closed, 
and I opened the collector and I still got zero voltage. And once again, as Chris said, we want to make sure that our uh, fuse is, is suitable. Uh, the AC fuse and the event recorder fuse are both the one amps. The DC fuse is the two amps. Uh, if we did have a problem, and I think Chris is going to cover this, we could always borrow the DC fuse to uh, make do. But that's one of the things that I uh, think that every operator ought to take with them is to pack a to-go package uh, in case there are issues. I talk about fuses. I talk about uh, your notebooks and that kind of thing if there are issues, the voltage uh, uh, tester, the receptacle tester, those kind of things. That way, if there are problems and you have the ability to call me from the site, then we can talk about it. You can troubleshoot it without having to make a necessary trip back and forth. Okay, let's go ahead and talk about hooking up the battery. So let's go ahead and hook the battery up. Okay. What I want to do is I do not want to hook this from the battery to the collector. I want to hook it from the collector to the battery. Because when I do this, safety once again is I'm going to introduce. And I got to understand that when I set this on that box, I'm already connected to the battery. So I want to basically... Wait, on. Jeff, here. We've got an issue. And you have prompted you yesterday. You notice we're still plugged into the wall here. Right. So before you hook that up... Right. I was getting there. I knew you were. I was getting there. As Chris mentioned, and he caught me, and that's a good thing, but I was getting there, is the fact is that before we do any fuse checking, we do any uh, hooking up of this wire or disconnecting of that cannon plug on that sensor, we want to undo the AC power. AC power is going to be the one that's going to be the dangerous one for us. And, so, and the reason we do that is there is polarity. We have to hook the plus to the plus and the minus to the minus. If we, for some reason, and we'll be checking the polarity, if we would, on first check, do it wrong, we'll have some interesting sparks. So go ahead and unplug that. So the first thing I want to do is I'm going to unplug my receptacle tester because there's no point in that being. And I also made another critical safety uh, boo-boo. I'm sitting here. I'm so concerned about my probes and my multimeter because I know I'm going to be checked momentarily that I'm actually sitting here grabbing an AC receptacle with a pair of uh, multimeter leads in my hand. Empty your hands like that. Make sure your multimeter's off. Get a good grip. Never try to grab it like this and do that kind of thing. You want to grab it by the face of the plug and pull it out, pull it straight out, and then we have disconnected the AC power to the collector. We may proceed from there. Please proceed. Okay. What we want to do, and as I said, one of the things that we do want to do is to hook it to the collector or to the motor box before we hook it to the battery because you got to understand that when we initially checked it and we'll check it again uh, just to make sure to double check ourselves that clarity does matter and out of the motor box as we lay the leads on there we're going to get a reading everybody can see that of 13.74 so we do know that we have live AC voltage or DC voltage and you verify that you've connected positive to positive and negative to negative. Positive well, is the black wire. And in this instance, some people use red uh, and black. Uh, we use black and white, white being the neutral and black being the positive. One of the things we want to do before we hook up our battery, though, is we don't want to make the assumption that this battery is necessarily good. Twice a year, we send out memos for the summarization and winterization uh, memos. Uh, to do battery maintenance, and it's something we'll also talk about in our upcoming webinar in September as we do site maintenance and winterization, is you want to check the battery a couple times a year, uh, remove the caps if it's not a maintenance-free uh, battery, uh, wearing safety glasses, uh, because that is sulfuric acid in there, uh, to make sure that there's water in each one of the six cells on the battery. So what I want to do is not make the assumption that I'm going to be hooking this collector up to a good battery, so I'm going to take my multimeter once again, polarity does matter, and lay my black lead on the negative and the red lead, and it shows that my battery is 12.34, so I know that I actually have a 12-volt battery that is functional, so it should be okay to hook it to the motor box. And that is just a quick check. Um, we put this in the memo. There are uh, handheld battery checkers, but we really do recommend that once a year you take it in, and most AutoZones or Parts Plus will do free battery checking. Um, 
And that's really the best way. They have much more robust equipment to, for testing the battery under load. We'll be talking about battery capacity. We'll get to that in a bit. But we'll be having some advice about what kind of batteries to get. Now, I'm a novice here, and you caught me from making a mistake here a moment ago. What's the best way to connect a battery? Should you always connect it positive first or negative first? Um, it probably doesn't matter in this case. I would probably do the negative first. OK. So with Chris's recommendation for safety. And what I like to do further, and I think Jeffrey Dolly pulled it off, um, I like to tape the free end. And just again, if you're like on something metal, um, you just don't like dangling ends that could short out. So um, he's going to go ahead and hook that up to the battery. But if you had it hooked to your battery, I, I like to keep the ends there. I have shorted equipment out in the field, so you learn by experience. OK, I'm going to hook my negative up first. And then what I want to do is I want to come over and hook it to my battery cable. What I'm going to do is then once I've got my, my cable in place, I'm going to hand tighten it. Uh, what you may want to do is take a little hand tightening is not always you know, going to get her done. Maybe take a little wrench and something like that and tighten it up. Because if it comes loose, then you could have a little bit of a play yeah, in it. You'll get arcing here, and it will build up corrosion. And actually, at battery parts stores or auto parts stores, they have, I, I think it's called like battery dressing, or some kind of uh, post. Um, it's like a little chapstick thing that you can put on there that keeps corrosion from forming. That's always a good thing to do, especially in moist environments. If I told you a can of Coke works just as well for cleaning off those types of connections, did you lose your wire? <laughs> yes, I did. Actually, it's right here. Your <laughs> wire is underneath you. Yeah. All That's right. the only thing I'm losing. But anyway, I've got my negative connected. Now I'm going to hook up my positive. And that's good practice like he's doing, so you don't have the live lead coming from the battery that could short something out. So hook it to the collector and then back to the battery. And once, you, once again, what Chris has done is he's taped, taken electrical tape and given himself about six inches of play off of the connector itself. It's kind of like a different, uh, what's the word I'm searching for, a resistance to, yeah. to having your hand on that. So you want to take it and make it ensure you're nice and snug up against your lead there on the motor box. Keeping it away, regardless of where your battery is set, is you want to keep it. You never want to take one lead and come across another lead with the potential of hitting the positive on the negative because 4th of July is way over with, and we don't want to reinvestigate that. Now, for our short run, we're fine just going with straight wires. If I had a longer run, the good practice would be to have some kind of inline fuses, and many battery boxes will have something like that, either a circuit breaker or a fuse in line, um, and we can give you advice on that uh, for your own condition. But that's always good practice. One of the uh, things that one of the things that you want to check now is uh, the importance is will the collector work off of a battery alone? Uh, if my power were to go out, like initially that I pop my uh, my GFCI when I first first set it up, uh, is the battery functional enough to where it'll open the collector? And he'll talk about battery capacity here momentarily, if I want to leave my AC unplugged momentarily and I want to activate my collector once again. So little rain here's, storm here's, coming here's in. Here's your opportunity. Once we'll get again. you moving. <laughs> OK, he got a little bit on the sensor grid. So now we'll see by looking at the, at the clutch mechanism that the collector is going to open. Um, as it opens, go on the same troubleshooting line as you would when you work with AC. Check to make sure that the sensor is cooled off. When you add the water, make sure that you notice a significant difference between when the collector is closed and when the collector is open as far as the heating goes, and make sure it heats up and closes on its own. I'm going to blow this sensor off so we can progress a little bit. And I'm going to make sure that I don't get Pat Sajak there with his uh, face. <laughs> OK, we've blown the. The water off of the sensor. Now, when you want to, when you've changed out your bucket and you've got a brand new bucket on there and you've capped your sample for the week, um, you know, a lot of operators, you know, you've, you've been told in the past or recommended that you blow off the sensor to close it. Yeah, that's good. And, but yet, I think it gets away from checking the real function of the sensor. Uh, that's seven minutes that, you know, if the sensor is functioning properly. That's seven minutes that the new wet side bucket is exposed to the elements. But I, myself, instead of putting the bucket on and blowing it off right away, I like to give it a couple of minutes 
just to see if that sensor is heating up. If it is in that case, then you want to blow off the moisture off the sensor to get the collector to close. I'll just make sure that you don't blow it towards the bucket, but you blow it away from the bucket. Okay, that's good. We're going to switch gears here a bit, and let's pause to see if there's any questions at this point, and there aren't. Uh, we still have people online, which is a good sign. Uh, <laughs> we're there. So we're going to switch gears and go to pro troubleshooting, power troubleshooting. So let's go ahead and turn to the other handout. It has the orange multimeter on the front. And I'm just going to hit a few points about uh, power troubleshooting, and then we're going to finish up with bunging up the collector and letting Jeffrey figure out what's wrong with it. Uh, let's turn to page two on that. We've already discussed this, and that's about troubleshooting the AC power. Again, that's your high voltage line power. We've talked about using our receptacle test. So that's a way that we can test the receptacles and their powering. Uh, page three talks about DC powering, and we talked about that, that the motor box provides a trickle voltage to supply the battery, and the battery can serve as a backup, as we saw, when we don't have the um, inline power. And we do need to check periodically both the voltage that comes out of the collector motor box that's supplying the battery and the overall battery condition. Uh, you wouldn't know from your camera, this actually battery would fail a load test. This is one we just have for testing purposes. So you indeed can have a battery that still powers the collector, but batteries lose capacity dramatically in cold weather. This battery would not likely work well in the winter because it just doesn't have the capacity anymore to power the equipment. So that even though a battery looks good, may operate your collector, uh, overall it may be in poor condition. Let's go to page four of your handout. I just want to touch briefly about battery capacity. We only have one battery here for backup, and that's probably sufficient for most sites where you have a short-term power outage, maybe 12 hours, maybe a day. That's probably sufficient. But uh, especially in winter when we have diminished battery capacity and we do have our sensor in its heating mode to melt snow, you can consume up to about 200 amp hours per week. And uh, if you don't have some sort of solar panel or wind power at your site or incoming AC to supply the battery, that's going to be problematic. So we actually recommend for sites that are primarily on DC power, that is typically operating off a solar panel, to have two or three batteries in parallel. And I emphasize the parallel because there's multiple ways you can connect multiple batteries up. If you want to build the overall capacity but maintain the output voltage, which is what we want to power our equipment, we would hook the batteries positive to positive and negative to negative. That keeps overall 12 volts, but it allows us to increase the overall capacity. And I'm sure Jeffrey will make this point. The challenge we have in linking batteries together is that you typically go to the weakest link of the chain. And you may have two good batteries, but a very old battery. And overall, your system just doesn't perform because it tends to sink to the level of its weakest performing battery. So if you have one battery go bad, you really want to check the condition of the other batteries. You don't just want to take out the bad battery, but really check all of them. Any points you want to make along no, that line? No, that's an excellent point because, like you said, it's the, uh, the system works according to the weakest link. Um, we do recommend about on the order of 180 amp hours. So that would be typical batteries are about 80 to 100 amp hours. Um, we've had some sites that have used a small battery like this. This is actually one that fits in our rain gauge. Uh, it's adequate to supply our electronic rain gauge. It does put out the correct voltage, but it has not near the capacity we need to power the motor box. For battery type, in any case, you want a deep cycle marine type battery. You don't want a standard automobile battery. The deep cycle marine batteries are designed to discharge completely at a slow and steady rate. A standard automobile battery is designed basically to start your car but not provide sustained power. Uh, this battery happens to be a lead acid battery that's in there. Uh, they're the more inexpensive ones. Uh, for the most maintenance free, there are the Adsorb Glass Mat or AGM type batteries. Those are much more expensive, uh, but they are good for use at sites for lower maintenance. Anything you want to add to that? Nope. Sounds good. Um, 
I know we we're down to about five or ten minutes for the rest of the webinar. We're going to be a little bit more troubleshooting. Before we get to that, I just want to touch briefly about solar sites. I imagine many of you on the webinar today do have solar sites, and they can be problematic. Um, the challenge we have is different people have different setups. So I'm going to just be touching on some common features at all sites that are solar powered. And I would refer you to the manuals that either came with your solar power setup or call us for further advice. On page five, it talks about the solar panel feed. Essentially, we'd have a solar panel feeding this battery uh, with regulated power and providing power to the collector. There is a voltage regulator between the solar panel that takes the output power from the solar panel and makes it a consistent 12 volts uh, for the purposes of our battery. If we turn to page six, the common problem that we have with the solar power panels is they can put out in full sun up to about 22 volts and that would basically destroy your battery. So especially uh, more inexpensive regulators don't regulate well the outgoing power. So you do want to periodically check that per the uh, recommendations of your solar panel uh, power regulator. Um, just briefly on page seven of your handout, there's some notes there about checking the blocking diode. Essentially what that does is it keeps power from your battery pushing back into your solar panel. So that's another important check you need to do. Again, it's difficult in the webinar to address this to everyone, so I'll refer you to the manual that came with it. I just want to make you aware of that's an issue that can happen if you're having problems at your solar panel site. Um, I think we've already touched on pages eight and nine. We talked about the DC voltage and load testing your batteries. And just to emphasize again, we'll send out reminders and memos. We do advise you, first of all, to have a backup battery and to load test it at least once a year. Uh, are there any questions at this point? I think since we're pushed on time, instead of you there, Pat, trying to fool me, how about we just kind of review the uh, troubleshooting that can uh, do, since we discussed AC and DC, just kind of do a uh, overall review of the safety and uh, doing a little troubleshooting instead of you trying to. Well, and that's a if we go through each point. So if we knew if this fuse had blown, how it would, how we would advise that. So let's start with the AC fuse. If this, this was actually the one I was going to swap out. So if this were the blown fuse, what would we see, Jeffrey? Well, you would get nothing would occur when you, uh, when you wet the sensor. And there again, you want to go back to your source and start at your, at your uh, plug-in with your receptacle tester and eliminate that as a potential. Uh, and then after you've done that, make sure that your sensor or that your uh, receptacle is alive. Uh, then you want to unplug it because you do not want to test a fuse, especially a 110 volt fuse. Uh, these are the types of fuses. And as I use my hand, push them in and turn and pull them out. Uh, if I were to not unplug the receptacle there, that would still be alive. So if my fuse is good, uh, then I'm going to set myself up to a 110 uh, AC current, and that's not something. So unplug the fuse first, and then take our multimeter, check the continuity of the fuse, don't visually inspect it, because that can fool you. As Chris said, it can sometimes burn up under the cap. Uh, check the continuity of the fuse, see if it's good, if it's not then replace it and uh, go from there. An excellent point. And whenever we check fuse condition, we definitely disconnect your AC power and strongly advise you to disconnect your DC power unless you're specifically troubleshooting that. As Jeffrey noted, you can get sparks um, uh, as you're putting those in and out. So that always, basically the, the common rule, always unplug your AC when you're troubleshooting your motor box. Uh, another thing is if we did have a good fuse here, we would be measuring a voltage output at the battery port if we had the battery disconnected. OK, let's move to the event recorder fuse. How would that? How would we know there was an issue there? Uh, obviously, uh, we're going to measure uh, when the collector's closed, we'll have a voltage of 0. When the collector's open, 12 and a half. When the collector closes, 0 once again. Uh, if we're getting 0 when the collector is open, then we possibly know that we have to check the connections, check the connections on the event recorder terminal at the motor box, check the connections on the event recorder terminal at your belfer or at if you have an electronic gauge. And uh, if those connections are fine, then we go to the fuse, check the continuity of the fuse once again uh, to determine if it's good. 
And the last one, the DC voltage. The DC fuse. is if you have a problem with the DC, uh, what you can do is if you don't have a fuse handy, uh, disconnect it. Um, there again, it's one of them things where if uh, you were to unplug the collector and try to activate the collector with your DC battery only and it's not working, uh, you want to check the fuse again uh, with the continuity, but disconnect it uh, from the motor box or actually I would disconnect it from the battery. Uh, that way you don't set yourself up for a shock. One important point, I get it to the site. I don't have my fuses with me. I've got an issue. Uh, and I need to borrow a fuse. My collector is run off AC slash DC power. My AC fuse is burnt, but I have a DC fuse in there. You can borrow the fuse from the DC to replace the one on the AC because it is a two amp fuse going into a one amp. What you could not do is take the one amp fuse and try to run it DC. You want you could go bigger to smaller, but to go from smaller to bigger uh, would overload it. Yeah, and just a few points. I said I'd talk about the NCON style collectors. They are much simpler. There is just one of these cartridge style fuses at the AC input lead. I don't have one to show you, but it's simply underneath. Uh, all NCON collectors are AC at this point. Even if you have a solar powered site, we you currently use an inverter to step up the voltage. So there's a single AC fuse, um, and then the event recorder works slightly differently. Um, that system is more robust than we've seen with the ACM, so we haven't seen any issues that you can readily troubleshoot in the field. But if you are having issues with your NCON style collector, just give us a call and we'll walk you through those steps. Uh, so for the last few minutes, let's just talk briefly about the sensor connections. We were going to touch on that and, uh, and how the sensor operates. Once again, it's one of those connections. It's fed by the 110 volts of the AC and by the 12 volts of the DC. When you activate the sensor, uh, if it does not work, if the collector does not open, you do not notice any heat. Uh, it's set up and plugged in by a cannon plug. What you want to do is disconnect your power once again. If you get to the site, collector's open on the dry side, there's no precipitation, sun shining out. What I'm going to ask you to do is disconnect the cannon plug on the sensor. What should happen is the collector should close. Be very careful with this because this is a live wire just as well. I cannot have you disconnect the power to this. And unplug, this, and unplug the cannon plug and get the collector to function to determine whether we have a bad sensor or a bad motor box. So be very careful and unplug it, unscrew it. It has a lot of long screw leads to it, and I'm going to unplug it. The thing I want to notice and what should happen is as I unplug this sensor, the collector should close. Uh, if it does that, then we have a a switching problem in the motor box or a potential a switching problem in both of them. What you see a lot of times is a failure of both the box and the sensor when you have thunderstorms. Uh, you can't see it very well, but if you look at the cannon plug on the sensor, you'll have a female, four female connectors that you plug into four male connectors on the motor box. Uh, sometimes what happens, I've had numerous operators say that nothing will happen. I'll ask them specifically, is the cannon plug on the sensor loose? And they'll say, no, I don't think so. And I'll say, go check it. And they'll come back and they'll jiggle a little bit and screw it back in. Everything works fine. So occasionally, that's one of the things that you have to check, uh, along with the connections for your battery, your connections for your event recorder terminal. Uh, just make sure on occasions, you know, once a month, uh, you're asked to clean off your lid seal or whatever, uh, or, you know, weekly clean off your lid seal. If it's uh, dirty, check your connections. Another check we can do, are we plugged in, Jeffrey? No, we're not. Okay, let's plug in, and I want to show another check that we can do for sensor troubleshooting. Um, the motor box clutch, you don't see the arm here, but this is the clutch, and it has magnetic switches in it that, that rotates it into the proper position. There's a clutch, and you can manually force it out of position, and the motor box will power up. So that's another way we can troubleshoot the sensor. The sensor may not operate, but we can distinguish a sensor failure from a motor box failure by simply reaching under the collector and forcing the lid to open by releasing the clutch like I just did there. Uh, it seems like there's a bit of a resistance. You never want to force things, but it, if you simply pull on the little spring, you can release the clutch and it will operate around. One thing I'd like to interject is real quick is sometimes uh, sites that get a lot of snow with the AeroChem collectors, uh, with the, they'll always make the attempt to close. And what happens in the clutch mechanism 
a lot of times it'll get knocked out of gear. So the lid of the collector will just kind of flop back and forth without any resistance. If you take your hand and manually turn that till you hear it lock in like you did with Chris just turning it, then it'll put the collector back in gear and it'll make a determination as to come back to the wet or the dry side uh, based upon the amount of or the type of precipitation, if any, is occurring at that time. Well, that's our pretty much our session today. If you don't have anything to add, Jeffrey, we appreciate you all for your thank you for your time. Um, do we have any last questions? We covered a lot of information again today. Uh, thank you to Brian Kirshner and to the director of the Central Analytical Laboratory, Chris Lehman. Uh, as we said before, 1-800-952-7353 uh, is the 1-800 number for uh, calling for problems or if you just want to discuss what we talked about today. If you have a need to go back or a desire to go back and watch our previous three seminars, go Illinois.edu. Uh, it's the website that was up on the initial title page. You can go back and watch the other ones. That will put you to the page to view the other webinars. And just some reminders, we sent this out. If, uh, we are looking for feedback on sites that may be impacted by irrigation. Uh, please complete the survey. If you haven't already, that's at go.illinois.edu forward slash irrigation, all one word. And again, I'd just like to invite you to our next webinar, which will be August 21st on the USGS Field Quality Assurance Programs for NTN and NDN. And then keep in mind the session we will be having in mid-September for site maintenance, siting criteria, and winterization. Thank you again very much. Uh, you will be receiving a survey after this webinar. We do take that uh, very seriously. Your responses, um, both positive and negative, and we continually try to strive to improve these uh, to your benefit. Thank you for your time today. I hope you have a great day.